Hello and welcome to episode 69 of Prosperity by the Pine. I'm your host, Bryce Carter, certified financial planner, chartered financial consultant, certified investment management analyst, and self-proclaimed millennial money expert. This is a podcast where we talk about money, investing, business, and life success, all while having a cold beer. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we're about to find out in a minute, I'm not having a cold beer this week. Everybody in my life is drinking White Claws, Trulies, and other nefarious alcoholic water, and so I thought I'd give it a try and, and see what that's like. So... <clears throat> Without further ado, a White Claw Tangerine. Nervous, folks. Ugh. That is, uh, that's probably what beer tastes like in communist Russia. That is just awful, awful. It tastes like mildly flavored water. It might as well be, it might as well be, I don't know, just, it might, it's water. It's water water. It's terrible. It's horrible. I mean, for beer, it's horrible. I mean, for water, it's better than average, I guess. I don't, it's awful. I would not recommend that. So that's going to be no for me, dog. Um, Episode this week, we're talking about how brokerage accounts are taxed. So let's talk about this. There's first understand there's, there's taxable accounts and tax deferred accounts. So a brokerage account typically refers to a a non-taxable or a a non-qualified account. So a non-qualified account just means that it does not receive preferential IRS treatment. So there's taxable and tax deferred. Tax deferred, that's things like your IRA, your 401k, your Roth IRA, et cetera, retirement accounts typically, and they receive preferential treatment. Basically, you're not paying tax on them on an ongoing basis unless you're withdrawing uh, funds. A taxable account or a brokerage account or a non-qualified account, those are all acceptable terms. It might even be called an individual account or a joint account. Those are taxable accounts, typically brokerage, right? And there's four types of ways in which you might get dinged with taxes on these types of accounts. Now, again, not all taxes are bad. So if you're paying tax on the account, odds are you're making money. It's worse things in the world than having to pay tax on a dollar you made, right? So four types of basically income that could be taxed in a taxable account. Short-term capital gains long-term capital gains, bond interest, and dividends. So first, I'm going to break down each each one of these and then get into some strategies on how you can be tax efficient with your investing. So what a short-term capital gain is. Let's say I buy Amazon stock for $3,000 a share. And in one month, it's worth $3,300 a share. So a $300 gain or 10% gain, however you want to put it. So I sell it. I said, you know what? I'm happy with 10% gain in a month. Who wouldn't be, right? That's 120% a year. You sell it. You had what's called a short-term capital gain because you bought an investment, you sold it for a gain, and you held that investment for less than 12 months, less than one year. So if you buy an investment and you sell it for a gain in less than one year, you pay short-term capital gains tax. Now, what is short-term capital gains tax? Basically, you pay taxes at whatever your normal income tax rate is. So the income tax brackets are basically 10%, 12%, 22, 24, 32, 35, or 37%, depending on how much uh, income you make. So basically, let's uh, use an example here. If you make uh, $80,000, you are in the every dollar over $80,250 is taxed at 22%. So short-term capital gain rate is whatever your tax bracket is, whether you're in the 15, 20, 22% bracket, that's what you pay, okay? So again, a short-term capital gain is you bought an investment, you sold it for a gain, and you held it for less than one year. That's a short-term capital gain. Long-term capital gain. Now, long-term capital gain gets special treatment. So a long-term capital gain is anything over one year. So if you buy an investment and you sell it for a gain, but you held it for longer than one year. So same example, bought Amazon for $3,000 a share. I sold it for $4,000 a share. 14 months later, I held it for more than a year, right? I get to pay capital long-term capital gains rates. Long-term capital gain rate is either 0%, 15%, or 20%. So if you're in a lower income bracket, basically if you make less than $80,000 a year as a, as a married filing and jointly, as a married couple makes less than $80,000, you pay no gain, no gain tax on that. If you make over eighty, dollars but less than $500,000, you pay 15%, which is not bad. I mean, because normally on income you'd be paying at, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand, you'd be paying 32%. So you'd pay zero, 15, or 20%. I'm going to have to take a drink of this commie beer 
just because I'm getting <clears throat> a little parched here. My assessment has not changed. It's still awful, but it parched my, uh, it quenched my thirst. So 0%, 15% or 20%, basically, unless you're in the highest bracket, you're going to pay 0, 15% on long-term gains. Again, it's an investment gain that you've had the investment for over 12 months. Bond interest. This is where it gets complicated. <clears throat> Let's say you own bonds or bond funds in your portfolio. It could be taxed a variety of different ways, depending on how the bonds, what types of bonds they are. So there's corporate bonds, there's treasury bonds, which are U.S. federal government bonds, and then there's municipals. So I'm going to handle the simple one first, and that's municipal bonds. Generally speaking, municipal bonds are excluded from federal taxes. You don't have to pay any taxes. If you live in a state that has no income tax and you don't have any city tax, you might not have to pay any tax on that interest. So that being said, municipal bonds, municipal bond funds tend to be very tax efficient. And you have U.S. Treasury bonds. So these are bonds issued by the federal government. Those are exempt from state taxes, but you have to pay federal tax on it, okay? And you're going to pay tax at essentially ordinary income rates. There's no special long-term capital gain rate or short-term capital. You're going to pay it, whatever your bracket is, okay? And then there's corporate bonds. Corporate bonds, you have to pay federal tax and state tax and city or uh, local tax if you have that. So, And you're going to pay it at ordinary income rates. So this is where, it, again, like I said, it gets, it gets rather complicated. If you're in a higher tax bracket, you might need to own only municipal bonds for your bond portion because it, you're, even though you're going to earn less interest with municipal bonds, a lot of times you earn less interest, a lot of times the interest is tax-free, at least at the federal level. So it can get really complicated. Again, this is an overview. I don't know you. You don't know me personally, likely. This takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of work with your tax accountant. It takes a lot of, um, uh, I, I guess, investment and financial planning to get this right and to be tax efficient with it. So again, this is just kind of a high level overview. And this is something in my, my financial planning practice I actually spend a lot of time on. We have algorithms, trading algorithms set up that are designed to make sure that we're minimizing taxes uh, in, in portfolios. So the last topic is, is, well, the last category of income that you might have that's taxable is, is dividends. So we have qualified dividends and non-qualified dividends. Again, we're starting to get a little complicated here. So qualified dividends can be taxed at capital gains rates. They can be taxed preferentially. Again, that can be zero, 15 or 20. Non-qualified dividends are taxed at ordinary income rates. So for example here, in, to take a step back, Bonds typically pay interest. Stocks pay dividends. There's a couple episodes previously. I've got bonds 101. I've got stocks 101. Listen to those. They'll explain some of this in a little bit more detail. So a qualified dividend is a dividend from a company that is one has to qualify one of these ways. Must be paid by a U.S. company or a qualifying foreign company. It can't be listed on the IRS exemption list. So there's an IRS list that says that their dividends do not qualify. So you got to know that. And then there's a, a required dividend holding period. So if you bought the stock for the dividend specifically and then sold it after, you might not, even though it would normally be a qualifying dividend, it might not qualify. So again, dividends can be, if they're qualified, they're paid at long-term capital gains rates, which are 0, 15, or 20 or if they're non-qualified, which is if they don't fulfill one of those obligations. Again, it gets a little bit complicated, but that's the high overview. Now, I wanted to talk for just a few minutes about how to be tax efficient, things and tips, and you should try and do some more reading, talk to your financial advisor, talk to your accountant about these things. How to invest efficiently for taxes. So the first thing is own stocks, try to. In a perfect world, if you have a portfolio that's $100,000 of non-qualified money, taxable brokerage account type of money and a hundred thousand dollars of qualified money, IRA, IRA, 401k type of money. And your risk profile says that you should own 50% stocks and 50% bonds. In that very specific scenario, you would own your stocks in your taxable account and you would own your bonds in your IRA account. The reason being is stocks. If you, as long as you're smart about it, you only pay cap gains rates. Bonds you would pay ordinary income rates. But again, on qualified money, the taxes are deferred. You don't have to pay it until you pull out money. So try in general, very broad term here, own stocks in non-qualified or brokerage accounts and own bonds in your qualified or IRA accounts. Make sense? 
if you own muni bond, if you own bonds and your taxable account, look at muni bonds because muni bonds again are not taxed at the federal level. They might not be taxed at your state level if you have no state income tax or if you buy your state's bonds. So muni bonds are really efficient. They can be efficient. You got to use them the right way. When buying bonds or when buying funds, stick to passive or index funds. And the reason being is if I buy an active fund, even regardless of everything else, all the statistics that tell us that that index funds and passive funds do better over a long period of time, regardless of all that statistics, active funds are always buying and trading on the internally, which means that they kick out capital gains distributions as they buy and sell. Even though you might not have bought and sold, you'll have to pay income on some of the gains that the fund that you own has had. It's very complicated. I get it. But passive or index funds tend to be more tax efficient than active funds. That's the general rule there. Tax loss harvesting. So this is where I spend quite a bit of time with our portfolio team and our trading team planning on this particular scenario. So let's say I buy an S&P 500 index fund and it goes from $10,000 down to $8,000. I can sell that fund for a $2,000 loss and claim that loss as a tax deduction. You can claim up to $3,000 a year in tax loss deductions, okay? You can actually claim more than that if you're offsetting gains, but you can claim up to $2,000 or $3,000 per year in tax loss deductions. So I bought a fund for 10,000, it's worth eight, I sell it. Now I got a $2,000 loss I can use as a deduction. I can hear it now, but Bryce, then I'm not invested anymore. You can buy another S&P 500 index fund or equivalent, something similar. It can't be in the IRS calls it substantially equivalent. That just means you can't sell Amazon and buy Amazon. You can sell an S&P 500 fund though and buy another S&P 500 fund. And so you can do that all in the same day. You you, you buy, you, you bought the S&P 500 index fund, you know, a month or two later, it's, instead of being worth 10, it's worth eight. You take the $2,000 loss. At the same time you're taking that $2,000 loss, you put your 8,000 back into another S&P 500 index fund. You can do that as long as you wait 30 days to repurchase your original fund. So I'm going to say that again so it sinks in. Buy a fund for $10,000. It's now worth eight. Crap. You got a $2,000 loss. That's okay. Sell it. Buy a fund that looks, feels, operates, invests in the same type of stuff. So you sold your fund so you can realize a $2,000 loss. You bought the funds, that uh, something's really pretty darn close. So you're still invested. And now you're no worse off and you get a $2,000 tax deduction. Boom. There you go. So we actually do this, you know, uh, for our clients on a regular ongoing basis. It's something that we look at as part of our job as financial advisors. This is a relatively broad, complicated topic. There's a lot of nuances to it. It takes a lot of planning. I really, with this one, encourage you strongly, work with a financial advisor, work with your tax accountant, uh, understand this topic as best as you can before you start to make changes to your portfolio because of Bryce's you know, podcast episode. That's going to do it for this week. I hope you, uh, you know, subscribe, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you listen. That's where you are. Cheers. Don't drink these beers for commies. The topics that I discuss in this podcast are meant to be general information and educational only. I'm not giving you specific advice because I don't know you personally. In order to give you specific advice, you should work with an advisor or someone that can learn your specific situation and give you advice that applies to you. If I talk about a specific security, please keep in mind I'm not recommending that security. And don't forget, investing involves risk. When you invest, there's always the possibility of losing capital, which is why you should consult with a qualified, licensed financial advisor prior to investing.